Absolutely, and fortunately, uh, th there's a good end to this. So uh, when, uh, historically, when oral contraceptives and uh, the hormonal agents for menopause first came out, late 60s, early 70s. Dr. Russell Broadus, how you doing today, my friend? Very good, how are you? I am wonderful. Today we're going to be talking about some pathology. Uh, we were joking before I hit record that pathologists are not the stereotypical live in the basement, uh, never want to talk to people type. Um, the I think pathology is probably the most represented specialty on e-shadowing. So Man, welcome. that's actually good to hear. We need more uh, very talented pathologists. I can tell you that. Why is that? Why do we need more um, of you? You know, so uh, a few things. One, um, the field is aging. I think uh, there's a couple of fields in medicine that are aging, but pathology is one of the ones uh, uh, that's aging the most. So we're going to have, I would say, in the next five, 10 years and even more, a lot of faculty or a lot of pathologists retiring out of the field. And we don't have, we, you know, pathology has always suffered from a, not a very robust number of med students who want to get into the uh, field. And I think that's only getting worse uh, yeah. uh, over the last five or 10 years or so. So, you know, I view programs like this as an excellent opportunity uh, for us to, to reach out to uh, students interested in, in going to medical school. Do you think, uh, I, I talk to a lot of physicians about their specialty and, and what they do and why they like it. And a lot of times a specialty is chosen based on rotations and mentor connections during medical school. Pathology is not a required rotation right. for most medical schools, if if any. I mean, I'm, there may be one out there, I don't know. Right, very few. Why? Why is that? And and yeah. should it be required so that we can get more exposure? Well, and, and I think, um, so let's rephrase the question a little bit. Should it be required not so much for the purpose of bringing more pathologists yep. into the field? You know, selfishly, yes, that's what I would <laughs> like. Yeah. But let's look at this a little bit more altruistically. Um, should there be more exposure so that all medical professionals get, you know, understand what pathology is? Absolutely, yes, I, I would. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to a number of the older surgeons, they would tell you the same thing. Uh, when I talk to uh, uh, friends of mine who have fathers or, or who have parents who were uh, surgeons and, and now retired, they're stunned that uh, that uh, surgery residents used to routinely uh, rotate in, in pathology. It's like mm -hmm. uh, a first or second year, you know, for a month or even longer. Yeah. Um, and, and they're stunned that uh, that that these rotations aren't required. So I think in order to understand, you know, this great abyss, this black box of pathology, where you know. Literally, you feed a blood sample in or you feed a tissue sample in, <laughs> and then by some miracle of miracles within a day to a week, you get a really important result. I mean, people don't understand that black box. And so, yeah. you know, just for the purpose of understanding that, it, it would be good to do a month rotation yeah. in, in pathology. I I, I don't know if you can see it on the side of my face. I have a Band-Aid. The, the dermatologist took a yep. chunk out and sent it to the pathologist for, for review. Luckily, it's yes. benign. Um, good, good, good deal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my, my, my pale redheaded skin is like I'm constantly looking for stuff. Um, interesting. So it, it's it's interesting to know, right, especially surgery, where a lot of times you're in the middle of the operating room going, uh, Hey, pathologist, I, I sent you some, uh, uh, what do you call it? A frozen, um, what do you call that? Uh, a frozen section. Yeah. yeah. Frozen section. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's read that. Um, like it, it would be interesting. Like why, why isn't there that more intimate knowledge of what's happening to that tissue as I'm standing yeah. in the OR so uh, and, and we do get it with some specialties. So mm -hmm. uh, they, they kind of tend to be more in niche areas 
of medicine. So as an example, uh, nephrologists. So those are internal medicine trained, and then they do a nephrology uh, a fellowship to take care of uh, uh, patients with kidney problems or, or renal failure. Uh, many of them work pretty closely with uh, pathologists, and those are pretty specialized trained uh, uh, pathologists as well to understand uh, what's going on with their uh, patients, because really it's the kidney biopsy uh, really dictates what those nephrologists will do uh, with those patients. And it can be drastic things like, you know, increase steroids, uh, treat with something else, you know, patient goes on to transplant. Uh, is there transplant rejection, things like that. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Uh, I know you have a presentation for us. I'd love to jump into that. Um, for those of you watching, uh, go ahead and say hello where you're watching from uh, if you're interested in pathology. And hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A as well at the end. Yeah, absolutely. I plan on, uh, 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 for this talk, uh, uh, just the first uh, a couple of parts of it will be just general my view of what pathology is, uh, a few thoughts on why I went into pathology, uh, and then a, a few examples of where I see like uh, my area of pathology, surgical pathology, how it's really important in driving uh, patient care. So uh, uh, that's how I have it organized. So uh, basically, pathology is uh, a four-year residency after medical school. It's broadly uh, divided into anatomic pathology and uh, clinical pathology. Uh, AP uh, encompasses all the areas of surgical pathology, which I'm in. Uh, cytopathology, which is dealing with very small uh, uh, tissue samples, cells, uh, aspirates of masses, fluids and uh, autopsy pathology or forensic pathology. Uh, clinical pathology is just an enormously wide uh, field. It encompasses uh, hematopathology where you're diagnosing leukemias and lymphomas and bone marrow uh, biopsies, uh, medical microbiology where you're working with infectious disease uh, experts, uh, frequently immunogenetics, uh, clinical chemistry, uh, molecular diagnostics, cytogenetics, and uh, transfusion medicine and blood banking. So I have cytopathology and transfusion medicine highlighted uh, because these are the areas, you know, where people say, well, pathologists don't really deal with real patients or have any <laughs> direct patient contact. Actually, cytopathologists and transfusion medicine, I mean, they are quote unquote real doctors. They actually touch patients. <laughs> Uh, uh, every day. <laughs> and, and so uh, if you're interested in pathology, but feel like, oh, you know, I don't want to give up that direct patient uh, uh, contact, uh, these are excellent fields uh, to enter into. Um, it is possible for residency to do uh, either AP only or, or CP only. I think, you know, if you know you're going into an academic practice or university-based practice, this may be okay. Uh, increasingly though, I see these AP and CP fields kind of blend together. So exam for example, molecular diagnostics is really important in a lot of areas of surgical pathology. And in surgical pathology, it's nice to know that, that you know some hematopathology uh, and cytogenetics and, and molecular diagnostics as well. So um, I really recommend, unless you have a really compelling reason, I recommend to med students uh, to do the combined uh, four-year residency. Uh, so why did I go into uh, uh, pathology? Um, some of this is kind of funny, but, but it's true. Um, my parents uh, were both uh, uh, teachers, and uh, so teachers, you know, had teacher salary. Uh, so they really believed in us uh, uh, reading books. And so they would take us, I grew up in El Paso, Texas. They would take us to this monthly uh, used book sale that was downtown El Paso every month. And it was basically just this warehouse that just had this huge supply and, and not even really well organized, just stacks of books use books everywhere. And so for paperbacks, they cost 50 cents and hardbacks uh, cost a dollar. And so when I was in uh, elementary school, 
I found this old uh, edition of Robin's uh, pathology basis of disease. And it was even an older edition of this. <laughs> I couldn't even find a picture uh, of this older edition. And, you know, so I started looking at it. It had all these grotesque pictures, had all these organs that were sliced, all these really gross uh, things in it. I didn't understand the text at all, but I knew I loved the pictures. I said, this is really, really interesting. And, and I would pick up this book all the time and just read the captions of the picture. I was just fascinated uh, uh, with the book. And so fast forward a little bit, my uh, senior year in high school, I had an advanced biology uh, class uh, where we did a lot of microscopy work. We did a lot of microbiology work. We did a lot of work with a microscope. And I found I really, really loved this. You, you know, we, I, I was on the football team at the time so football kept me very busy. So I, uh, you, my usual lunches in the fall of my senior year of high school, the first 30 minutes were watching film with a football team. The second 30 minutes was uh, in, in this uh, classroom, you know, kind of eating a sandwich with one hand and looking through the microscope uh, uh, with the other. <laughs> um, what is that thing? Oh, it's just mayonnaise. Exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, fast forward again to med school. Um, I had a hard time with choosing a specialty. Uh, I really did enjoy most of my clinical uh, rotations. I really did like seeing patients. I like to think I was pretty good at uh, 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 seeing patients. But when I really was honest with myself, and this is what I really encourage med students uh, uh, to do, um, really have that heart to heart conversation with yourself and say, what was it that I most enjoyed about this rotation? What was it that I most enjoyed uh, about all my clinical rotations? And when I did this for myself, I really figured out, I said, you know, I really enjoyed figuring out what disease these patients had. You know, when we got a new patient in the ER or, or, or admit it was fun being on call because we didn't know what that patient had then the workup and all this. Then once we figured out what the patient had, my interest, you know, it's sad to say this, but my interest just really dropped. I was not interested in the therapeutics. Uh, I really wasn't all that interested in the management of the patient. And that's what a lot of, you know, medicine, uh, uh, internal medicine physicians, uh, surgeons, that's what they do. They treat the patient. And I was interested in figuring out what the patient had, but not necessarily in treating the patient. Um, I was also really interested in learning about molecular mechanisms uh, of disease. I, 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 I got this uh, interest during college and that just kind of fed all the way through med school. So I think adding all this together really led to uh, a, a desire to pursue pathology residency. Uh, so some common misperceptions about pathologists and pathology. Uh, one, our only job is autopsies. You know, yes, uh, during training, we do uh, autopsy. I actually had some really, really interesting autopsies that taught me a ton. And, and I still reference uh, uh, these autopsies when uh, we teach our residents. Uh, but my current job and my job when I was uh, at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston uh, re really didn't depend on autopsies so much. Uh, another common misperception is that we're all housed in the dark basement. Uh, I, I'm, I'm privileged right now at, uh, at North Carolina. My office window actually looks into the football stadium on campus. So that, that's not such a bad thing. Um, another very common misperception is that we are not, uh, that a pathologist is not a people uh, a person. They don't like to communicate and this is something I make very clear with med students who, who are entertaining the idea of going into pathology. I say, I, I always tell them, you may not be communicating with a patient directly every day, but your communications are with other physicians. And yeah. that is hugely important, it, it, whether that's verbal or, or written in your reports, they have got to be crystal clear so that other physicians understand what you're saying so that the patient can be treated uh, really well. So um, I would argue that uh, not only do we have to be a, a people person, we have to be really, we have to be even better with our communications uh, than yeah. other physicians. Um, 
Another misperception is that uh, this is a default specialty. Uh, and, and I've heard uh, med students and, and college students tell this to me before, like, you know, I don't particularly like working with people. I don't really like direct patient care. So I'm going into pathology. And uh, to me, if this is the way you're thinking, I would encourage you to rethink your idea about going into medicine in general. I mean, all of us, even pathologists, like patient care. I, I mean, and patient care is very important uh, uh, to what we do. So it's not a default uh, uh, to go into pathology. Mm -hmm. And then I think another very common misperception um, is that these lab results that, that many physicians rely upon uh, for accurate patient care are just instantaneous. Like, you know, you feed blood samples. <laughs> Thanks, TV <to> shows. <laughs> right, yeah, they just poof, they come out within in minutes. And um, it's it really, to, for, for some of these, you know, for, especially for some of the blood chemistries, this is actually pretty true. Uh, other tests are much more sophisticated and, and could take uh, a, a little bit longer and take a lot more intellectual design uh, uh, to get the answer. Um, so why did I choose pathology in a university-based state? So, so you know, I, 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 I've worked in an academic uh, a medical center my entire uh, career ever since uh, uh, finishing residency. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. And a lot of them really feed into pathology as a discipline as well. Uh, one, I've always had a real passion for research and discovery. Uh, the discipline of pathology really lends itself to that. We, we get access to a lot of cool uh, laboratory toys, if you will, but you know, it, uh, professional term is equipment. Uh, to test in our clinical labs. And, and that's a lot of fun. And, and you get access to a lot of cutting edge uh, uh, laboratory tools to help in patient care. Um, University-based care uh, provides you the real opportunity to advance the field. Uh, you perform patient-oriented research, not this more esoteric uh, uh, research on model organisms or, uh, uh, or on experimental uh, uh, systems. And you're often in university-based settings, you get exposed to very new clinical opportunities before they're out there in the real uh, world. So as an example, uh, solid tumor molecular diagnostics is fundamental to what we do in hematopathology and in surgical pathology for a lot of our uh, uh, patient care settings. This wasn't even a discipline when I started residency. You know, we had just started doing some of this as I uh, became a senior level resident. So that's how fast the field can change, uh, uh, especially when you're in pathology. Um, you know, I've always thought that, uh, I've always enjoyed very complex problems and tackling these complex problems. They usually require a multidisciplinary approach and I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. Um, Another reason to be in a university-based setting, I've always enjoyed teaching. My parents were teachers. Uh, they never pushed me and they, they weren't physicians or scientists. Uh, my dad was a history professor and, and my mom was an English professor. Uh, they were stunned that I went into teaching. They said, you know, you, you see how hard this is for us. Why did you want, want to? And I said, I just, you know, I saw how often their former students would come up to them, you know, just when we were out to dinner or out shopping or something and, and just, you know, greet them and say how much they had helped them. And, and like telling me, you know, when I was like very little, you know, you have no idea how lucky you are to have, uh, you, you know, these parents, they made such a big impact on me. And so you start seeing that over and over. You start saying, you know, teaching isn't such a bad uh, uh, profession and, and pathology. We do a lot of that. And then uh, some of this is altruistic. Uh, I honestly believe uh, uh, being a teacher in, in a clinical practice in a university-based setting is the best thing that you can do, no matter your clinical mm -hmm. uh, uh, discipline. Uh, so why is multidisciplinary uh, uh, so important? And why do I make a, uh, uh, why am I specifically mentioning this? Uh, one, it recognizes that most diseases and health problems now are very complex. 
And so when we have complex problems, what we really like to try to promote is that we do a multi-pronged approach uh, to solving these complex problems. So for healthcare, what derives disease complexity and by far the, the biggest factor in driving this complexity is heterogeneity. And, and I can tell you, and I, and I will show you some examples that pathologists are really well-trained to recognize and appreciate uh, this heterogeneity. So one, just at a simplistic level, let's just discuss for a few minutes what, how a, 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 a heterogeneity drives uh, complexity. So let's take the case of these two sisters. Uh, phenotypically, they look a lot alike. There, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Genotypically, since they're sisters, we know that there's a lot of overlap. So there's a lot in common between these two. But when you do some careful inspection, there is a lot that distinguishes uh, uh, these two sisters. Younger sister on the left is very boisterous, while the one, older one on the right is more introverted. Uh, younger sister is, is a writer interested in public policy. Uh, older sister uh, on the right is, uh, uh, has a big background in science and mathematics and is currently a medical student. Uh, the younger sister enjoys theater. Older sister can't stand theater. She likes dance. Uh, older, a uh, younger sister, anything but sports. Older sister lives and breathes with football. So a lot of differences between these two, despite their obvious uh, uh, similarities. So let's take that into uh, uh, the medicine world. And, and we'll show after this slide a number of examples of how rep uh, recognizing this heterogeneity is so important to pathology, but it's also really important uh, uh, for the accurate uh, uh, care of patients. Um, so let's think back a little bit. Let's go back about five or six decades, not that long ago. And frequently you would hear the statement that I have cancer and it would just cause shock and horror amongst people because people understood that cancer, the C word, was a terrible diagnosis. We didn't have good treatments for it. And universally, this meant that you were going to die. I, I mean, in the 1940s, I mean, you were going to die uh, uh, of your cancer. Um, and, and as an example of this, this is, uh, I show an example of an acute lymphocytic leukemia. This was the type of leukemia, it wasn't recognized as ALL, it was just a, a leukemia, that the first President Bush's, uh, uh, one of their daughters, uh, had this uh, diagnosed when she was a very young child, I think four or five years old, and died within about a year of diagnosis. There's nothing you could do for uh, 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 young kids with this diagnosis uh, uh, back in the 50s. So let's fast forward a little bit in, in the 2000s. A friend of ours, a young daughter, same exact diagnosis, acute lymphocytic leukemia, Today, it has over a 95% survival rate, long term, not, and not just long term survival, cure rate uh, 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 from this disease. So, same disease, different era, it, it's uh, uh, completely curable. Now, there are other types of leukemia that unfortunately that we don't have this big success rate. So, that's why it's so important for pathologists to recognize what type of leukemia does. Uh, uh, this patient have because type of leukemia def uh, uh, directly reflects on type of treatment and type of prognosis uh, the patient has. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, because the heterogeneity here is so important in driving patient care, uh, uh, endometrial cancer. This is uh, cancer of the epithelial lining of the uterus. Uh, it's by far the most common uh, cancer of the female genital tract in the United States, much more common than ovarian or, or cervical cancer. And why it's so interesting slash very frustrating is that in contrast to many other common cancer types, the incidence of endometrial cancer is actually rising. So we have a lot of cancer types in the United States that through really good health care, good prevention, good interventions, good treatments, uh, the mortality is decreasing. For endometrial cancer, the mortality in the United States has actually been increasing. 
And uh, if you look at some of these graphs on the right, uh, uh, red is uh, endometrial cancer, gray is ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer has been decreasing in mortality uh, in the United States over the last several decades as endometrial cancer has been rising. But mm -hmm. almost all of this increase in mortality is in uh, black uh, uh, patients. And we don't understand why this is happening. You know, for white patients and non-Hispanic white patients, uh, uh, mortality has been rising, but it's been very, very slight. For black patients, it's been very sharp. For sure, some of this disparity is because of lack of access to good medical care, but that's not all of it. There's also some suggestions that the biology of the cancer in the black patients may be very, very different. So this is something for up and coming pathologists smarter than myself to help figure out. We need to understand the basis of this health disparity so we can start making a difference in this. Um, so how it's, is pep it's interesting to see that that it, it, we would talk about disparities, but a lot of that change was right around when the Affordable Care Act went into place. And like, yeah. the disparity should have lessened. It's interesting to see. Yeah, that. yeah. And part of this may be also that the rising, you know, and this is more of a modern phenomenon last 30, 40 years or so. Uh, the rising incidence, very sharp incidence of obesity in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that does tend to impact the black women patient population more so than why. I mean, uh, obesity is rampant all over the place, yep. but does tend to be a little bit more disparate in the uh, black patient population. But you're right. Um, this, it, it's probably a really toxic mix of lack of access to, to great medical care plus really adverse biology uh, yeah. that's going, and, and it's all very poorly defined right now. Yeah, and, and I think it's really important. Um, I, I, I border sometimes <laughs> worried about getting canceled. I, I think we we have a little bit too much of bo body positivity movement in this country yeah. where it's like, it's okay to be big. Right. Like, and, and technically I'm, I'm obese based on BMI. Um, like we know that obesity leads to all of these other things, including increased cancer risk. Right. Right. Um, and so, yes, love your body and <laughs> let's lose some weight. <laughs> right. Yeah. Love, but love yourself too. Yes. And, and so, um, <laughs> you, you know, it's interesting. Obesity is tied to all kinds of, of terrible things. Uh, in health and, and in cancer, it's loosely associated with lots of different cancer types. Uh, one thing I didn't show, uh, there, were, there have been a few studies that have actually tried to tease apart, all right, what specific cancer type is really driving this? And uh, obesity is so closely tied to endometrial cancer, it's just crazy. I, I mean, the risk, you, you know, all the other risks of cancer are, are, they're statistically significant. I just don't know how biologically significant they really are. Endometrial cancer, it's a huge relative risk wow. uh, uh, when you're obese. So there's something there in the, in the metabolism of those patients that's leading uh, to endometrial cancer. Hmm. Um, so this, this is one of those pleasant pictures that you always like to show uh, like during grand rounds, early morning breakfast time or noon uh, uh, seminars, but just to orient everyone. That's a McDonald's so, chicken nugget, right? Exactly. <laughs> This is a longitudinal slice through a uterus. So uh, cervix is down here. This is what we sample for pap smears. Uh, this is the muscle wall of the uterus, the myometrium. This is what grows during a pregnancy significantly. Uh, this is fallopian tube. This is a small ovary, para-ovarian soft tissue. And this is a large endometrial cancer. This is usually where endometrial cancers grow uh, up in the fundus or up in the upper portion uh, of the uterus. So, you know, we split open the uterus after surgery. We know there's a cancer here. So what other information is a pathologist providing that's so important to patient care? So when we look at this tumor microscopically, we have to determine, is it an endometrioid or non-endometrioid tumor? We can do that by light microscopy. This is really important. If it's a non-endometrioid tumor, this patient will get chemotherapy uh, after surgery in almost all settings. Whereas if it's an endometrioid tumor, patient most likely will not get chemotherapy after surgery. 
Uh, we take microscopic sections of the tumor in relation to the myometrium to figure out is it deeply invasive or not? Uh, does it involve the cervix or not? This invasion and involvement of the uh, uh, cervix all will help dictate uh, if this patient will receive radiation treatment after surgery or not. And then is there cancer outside the ears? Like has the cancer microscopically spread to the fallopian tubes uh, or any lymph nodes that get removed with the uh, uh, uterus? And if so, those patients will, uh, uh, will get chemotherapy as well. So all of these treatment decisions really rest on what the pathologist is figuring out from this uh, uh, surgical specimen. And, and this is just showing the microscopic spectrum of what we see in, in endometrial cancer. So lots of heterogeneity here. So if, if a patient tells, or if a woman tells me, I have a diagnosis of endometrial cancer, you know, the first thing running through my mind is, all right, you need to get more specific with me. Is it a grade one endometrioid adenocarcinoma, those patients have very good prognosis, very rarely uh, recur. If it's a serous carcinoma or carcinosarcoma, those patients need chemotherapy after surgery. These are very aggressive, very, very bad uh, cancers. These patients typically have very bad uh, uh, clinical outcomes. Um, so let's take a different uh, example of an endometrial cancer. Uh, here's another uterus. Uh, the, uh, it, it's also splayed open longitudinally. Uh, we have both halves. In this case, uh, the fundus of the uterus does not have a tumor. Um, and here's our cervix again for orientation. Instead, we have this kind of fluffy area, uh, a, a cancer growing in the uh, anatomic area called the lower uh, uterine segment. And this just shows a higher, uh, a higher picture view of this. So this is really ultra high magnification. This tumor was no bigger than a nickel. I mean, very, very small uh, uh, tumor. Wow. Unfortunately, at the time of diagnosis, uh, it had already uh, metastasized or spread to a regional lymph node and it had very aggressive non-endometrioid histology. It was a serous carcinoma mixed with a, uh, a, a clear cell carcinoma. These are some of the most aggressive uh, uh, endometrial cancers out there. And we could do special studies with this. So uh, this is the only science slide, uh, but this <laughs> is just to show what, uh, how we do immunohistochemistry. chemistry. This is a really uh, fundamental laboratory test that we do in the clinical pathology lab to help identify uh, proteins that are differentially expressed in uh, uh, tissues. And so when we do uh, immunohistochemistry for DNA mismatch repair genes, wherever you see brown signal in the nucleus, that means the protein is expressed. So uh, this cancer expressed uh, uh, mismatch repair protein MLH1, it expresses PMS2, but it does not express MSH6 or, or MSH2. Um, this would be the whole subject of another 60 minute lecture, but just very quickly, this is indicative uh, or very suggestive of a hereditary cancer syndrome called Lynch syndrome. Uh, this patient was identified as being a good candidate for having Lynch syndrome and was later identified uh, to have this hereditary cancer syndrome. So too late for this patient, but uh, this patient's family members could then be screened for colon cancers and endometrial cancers uh, to see if they were at risk for developing these at a younger age. Um, let's take a different uh, example. Um, this is uh, uh, how a pathology drives the clinical care of a patient who presents with a pelvic mass. So uh, this woman may have uh, reported feeling some bloating, uh, some indigestion, maybe fullness in the lower pelvis, usually not pain so much, but more of this kind of uh, uh, amorphous uh, uh, fullness feeling. And uh, when imaging was done, or if she's very thin, you could detect this on physical exam, this large pelvic mass was detected. So the treatment team does not need a pathologist to tell them to take this out. So no matter what, the surgeon is going to remove this pelvic mass. But everything that happens to this patient after that all depends on pathology analysis of this pelvic mass. So for example, first thing we need to do 
uh, to figure out is, is this pelvic mass benign or, or is it cancer? And if it's cancer, what type? So if this is benign, there's lots of cysts that pre uh, present as a, a pelvic mass. If it's benign, the patient requires no further surgery and no further treatment af af after the surgery and, and has very good outcome. If it's cancer, we wanna know what type because then that will dictate what type of uh, uh, subsequent surgery the patient will have and will also uh, 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 dictate uh, what type of chemotherapy the patient uh, uh, may receive as well as their long-term uh, uh, prognosis. Um, here's a different example. Um, this is a breast mass. So this was palpated uh, uh, by a woman and then subsequently removed. This uh, yellow is the fatty tissue. Um, this kind of pinkish white tissue is normal breast tissue. And then this here in the center is a lar uh, is a very firm, probably one to two centimeter uh, uh, breast cancer. You could tell it's can if you could feel this, it would feel rock hard. Mm -hmm. And these little specks right here that you see, kind of yellowish pink specks, for all necrosis, you usually see that in cancers. So this is a breast cancer. So again, surgeon does not need a pathologist to figure out that this is breast cancer. A lot of times by mammography, these, there's very specific changes that indicate it's a breast cancer. But where pathologists come in is they help to do additional laboratory-based tests that will tell the uh, oncologist what kind of treatment this patient uh, uh, needs to get and how this cancer should be classified. So again, if a patient tells me that they have breast cancer, first thing I want to know is, does this tumor express ER, HER2, or is it triple negative? Because all of those features help to tell me, A, how is the patient going to be treated? And B, uh, what's the long-term outcome for the patient? So if, if the tumor has strong expression of estrogen receptor, we can do this by immunohistochemistry as well. Those patients in the old days were treated with tamoxifen, now they're treated with aromatase inhibitors. And these patients, a lot of them have very, very good outcomes, even when they have metastases to axillary lymph nodes. Um, if it's not positive for ER or weakly positive for ER, we test for uh, HER2, uh, and that has, has a different expression pattern. It's not expressed in the nucleus, it's expressed uh, on the membrane. There's a very specific drug for testing, uh, for treating, HER2 positive breast cancer is called Herceptin. It works quite well, but these patients tend to recur. So it needs to be a backup plan uh, uh, when these patients recur. So prognosis here is a little bit worse than for ER positive breast cancers. And then if it's so-called triple negative, so if it doesn't express estrogen receptor, does not express progesterone receptor, does not express HER2, uh, then those triple negative breast cancers are usually treated with chemotherapy. Uh, sometimes we're considering immunotherapy for those patients. And, and those are very, very aggressive uh, breast cancers. It's very difficult uh, to treat. Um, this is a, a picture. So fortunately, Ryan, this was not what was on your <laughs> not uh, me. Uh, head. <laughs> so this is a classic picture of a melanoma. So uh, again, a surgeon or a dermatologist, this is so classic, they don't need a pathologist to tell it. This is a, this is a melanoma every day of the week and twice uh, on Sunday. But why do you need a pathologist? So when, when I was in residency, and I actually dug up this old uh, ID badge nice. of mine in residency, um, the, uh, uh, really all we did with these is we were confirming diagnosis, right? We would look light microscopy, take a quick look, yes, this is melanoma and didn't do much else uh, uh, with this. Today, confirming diagnosis of melanoma by microscopy is just the first step. What's really needed is subsequent lab testing to figure out what type of treatment this patient is going to get. So first thing we do is uh, pd one immunohistochemistry. Uh, if it's strongly positive within the melanoma, those patients will get uh, uh, immunotherapies with uh, checkpoint inhibitor blockade. Very, very effective for many melanomas. Um, we've heard about uh, former President Jimmy Carter in the news recently. Uh, he, he had a metastatic melanoma to like the liver and brain that was treated by 
immunotherapy, you, you know, if that would have happened when I was in medical school, he wouldn't have lived a couple of weeks uh, uh, with that. And yet he's lived for years uh, with that. And that's because the immunotherapy has been so uh, successful. Um, if uh, it does not express PDL1, we'll also do next generation sequencing. Uh, uh, of this melanoma, and if there's a, a BRAF V600 gene mutation detected, which is detected in a fair chunk of these melanomas, uh, these patients can get specific uh, targeted therapy directed uh, against this mutation driving uh, the tumor. And that kind of leads us to, uh, there's a lot of sophisticated tools in the clinical pathology labs. It's not just all about uh, the microscope. So uh, I introduced you to immunohistochemistry. This is widely used in, in, in clinical laboratories really throughout the world. Uh, we looked at next generation DNA sequencing, uh, but in addition, we use flow cytometry, especially in a lot of leukemias and lymphomas, uh, fluorescent in situ uh, hybridizations, uh, DNA amplification arrays. Uh, uh, we look for assays to detect fusion genes. Uh, some assays, not so much in cancer, but in other areas, like when working up amyloidosis, uh, we do mass spectrometry. Um, a really cool new area of, of oncology is using liquid, what we call liquid biopsy. So looking for tumor DNA in peripheral blood. And, and then kind of an emerging area is uh, uh, image analysis. So not just, uh, it, it's really unlocking the power uh, of the pathology uh, image. Um, so that's all I had about pathology. I think uh, before we uh, uh, open up for questions or discussions, um, I have an ask for everyone in the audience, and I, this is the same ask I ask of all of our students, is that wherever you land and however you land, whether it's in medicine or science, or, you know, in, in some other field, really spend time and spend effort and energy advocating for medicine and science. And, and how do you do this? So, you know, most of, a, most of us spend time with family or friends uh, during holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, 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 birthdays, and so on. All of us have older relatives that, you know, say, oh, what are you doing? You know, what, what kind of uh, work are you doing? If you're a scientist or a physician, it's really easy to dismiss people outside of your field as, oh, you wouldn't understand. And, and you just kind of, you never make the effort to explain to them. And um, I think that's why we have so much, you know, that's one of the big reasons why we have so much distrust of medicine and science right now is that science and scientists and physicians have not done a good job historically of engaging the non-scientist, non-physician community. So, you, you know, I always tell our students, you know, practice your five minute grandmother talk, make your relatives understand what you do and why it's important and use language that they can understand. And that effort, uh, if more of us did that effort, I think uh, 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 we would all be in a much better place. And, and I think this very tenuous relationship science and medicine has with the so-called outside world would not be uh, so adversarial. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, a really good question. When back when we were talking about the, kind of the increase, um, sharp increase among the the black population for endometrial cancer, um, I, and I've been trying to look at some graphs, trying to figure out potentially with ACA, one thing that came with ACA is coverage of birth control. Is, is there any correlation that we know of, of, of birth oh. control pills and, and endometrial cancers? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of medicine is pros and cons, you know, so, yep. all right, if I don't take this medicine, what happens to me? If I do take it, what happens to me? And, and how do you weigh that? Yeah. Um, for those of you watching, if you want to come on and ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand there using Zoom's tools. Uh, Oscar has a question. We'll let you talk, Oscar. Hello, how are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Oscar. How are you doing, Dr. Russell? Um, so I had a quick question. 
Um, I know that you spoke a little bit about the differences between uh, or the different types of approach that is used for pathology in, in, in a clinical environment. Um, I know there's some talk about multiomics and in general that like a combination of different um, approaches to this. How far away do you see that uh, coming into like a clinical environment? Um, I think in some aspects it's already here. So um where I think, and we've seen this a lot in the past too. So uh, uh, pathology, I, I think pathologists tend to get paranoid that, oh, such and such new technology is going to replace me <laughs> and it is going to replace <laughs> what I do. I, I think though, what I always encourage is think of it this way. Every new technology that we've onboarded in the past has not really replaced what a pathologist does it's made what we do better and it helps us provide right. more information. So in like the examples I just showed, instead of just saying, yes, this is melanoma by looking in the microscope, I tell you, this is melanoma. It does not express PDL one but it does have a BRAF E600 BE mutation. I've therefore told the oncologist specifically how this patient uh, uh, should be treated and similar with our breast cancer. So introducing these new technologies, it only makes pathology better. When pathology is better, all of our med medical care uh, is better. It gets much more specific. And, and that's where I think, you know, being a pathologist in the 50s, I, I just don't see, you know, it'd be interesting if I would have made that same career choice, because quite honestly, I don't know how much pathologists were really impacting patient care back in the old days. You know, I, I just, right. I think a lot of times we were confirming what yep. physician already knew, but now we give physicians really good clues on what's the best way to treat the pain. I mean, to me, that's very exciting. And I just see a lot of the multi-omic uh, technologies just met, helping us make our job much better. I mean, a, a, as an example, uh, image analysis right now, again, this was something that did not exist. Uh, uh, when I was in medical school as a resident. So this is something you get to see as you grow in your career. Um, we, have, we have scientists now and physicians now that can scan that same H&E stained slide that I look at under a microscope and they pick out information. There is no way the human eye can pick out and analyze the complex information that they pick out. And it's useful information. It's clinically uh, you, you, a lot of times you can predict disease outcomes with this. You can predict uh, molecular alterations using uh, this approach. So I, I think there's a lot of exciting things coming into pathology over the next few decades. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering that. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, it comes up all the time. Radiology and pathology is, yeah. is when, when is Google going to take over? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So and, it's, and it's same, same it's, with radiology, right? I mean, they yeah. do the same um, image analysis. Of it. So instead of just yep. you know, I see mass, you know, mass equals tumor. It's yep. this is a tumor, but it also has these extra characteristics, and it helps inform better yeah. uh, treatment of the patient. Yeah, they, they are adjuncts, not replacements. Um, right. And so potentially maybe, right, but potentially the downstream effect is we'll need 90 pathologists instead of 100, maybe, right? Yeah, maybe, um, right. Uh, but, Although I think you may need the extra 10 to help understand all the ancillary technology. Yes, they will be <laughs> pathologists and bioinformaticians. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a hard word to say. Um, all right, Lynn, hello. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I used to actually work in an analytical lab. So I think it'd be interesting, sort of in a similar context, like the introduction of robotics, I'm assuming must be happening, um, of, or at least eventually. Are there any hurdles to that, given that you're dealing with with um, patient and also possibly improving the experience of the patient in terms of like how a biopsy might be performed, et cetera? Yeah. So uh a lot of clinical labs, you know, unless you're a monstrous industrial size lab, so something like a lab core type scale where, where they provide laboratory services to good chunks of the country, we've only uh, incorporated robotics in a few areas of our lab, like in our clinical chemistry lab, uh, uh, where we handle, you know, th literally thousands of blood samples uh, a day and perform 
tens of thousands of, of tests on those. We have some robotics there. Uh, using barcoding, that's helped to uh, uh, move uh, specimens faster and helped us to be a little bit more agile versus the old days where you handwrite uh, uh, something on a label. But mm -hmm. robotics still has not made big penetration into most pathology labs. Okay, thanks. I was curious. <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we, it's not for lack of desire. It, it would be really cool. To, yeah, I'm wondering if it would be a great aid to we, increase like accuracy and everything. Yeah, we, we do have one of the, you know, this is a really draconian use of uh, robotics, but we do have one of those cool little, uh, looks like R2-D2 that uh, <laughs> uh, takes little uh, uh, specimens from one area of the lab to another area when it's mm -hmm. separated by, and those things are actually kind of fun to watch, so. Very, Very cool. cool. Thank you question well dr russell broadus thank you so much again for coming on taking some time uh away from patient care and other stuff that you're doing to to educate these 100 or so students that were on with us today yeah, hopefully no. some future pathologists in the mix yeah ho ho hopefully more than one and thank you thank you ryan for doing which i, I think this is really really important uh, uh what you're doing i think it's really cool that you take the time to do this yeah, no, it's exciting. Um, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Uh, we we had a little mix up, uh, Russell. Everyone was like, "I'm here to see family medicine" or something. The, the email had the wrong specialty. Uh, that person is next week, so so come hang out. But uh, you gave a, a great show today, so thank you, everyone, for coming again, Doctor Brodus. Thank you so much. Great, thank you.